Well, thank you everybody for showing. Uh, I'm Rick Wilson, the director of Ciencia, and I'd like to thank you for attending today's lecture. Well, this year's series is on the topic of creativity. Uh, while people in various disciplines advise different kinds of questions we ask and the methods that we use, I think what unites all of us at this university is uh, the creative impulse that we bring to our work. At least I hope that's the case. Uh, so this year, CNC is calling on people from different disciplines uh, to talk about how uh, their imagination works to tackle interesting questions and to pose novel ideas and solutions. Well, today we're very fortunate to have uh, Anthony Brandt speaking to us on the topic of imagination and inside look. And we're quadruply, I think is the word, uh, fortunate to have uh, Sam Park, uh, Jacqueline Otis, uh, Sergen Yap, and um, Catherine Otis uh, with us today. Uh, Professor Brandt earned his degrees from um, Harvard University, the California Institute of Arts, and Harvard University for his PhD. Uh, he landed in the Shepherd School in 1998 um, and is currently Professor of Composition and Theory at the Shepherd School. Uh, his honors include the Kusevitsky Commission from the Library of Congress, is that close to the correct pronunciation, uh, and grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, meet the composer uh, from the Houston Arts Alliance, and the New England Foundation for the Arts. His recent commissions are many, and include the Chamber, op uh, chamber Opera Ulysses Home, with the libretto by Nina Ber Berber, and um, and maternity uh, for soprano and chamber uh, orchestra with the libretto by David Eagleman, which I would really commend you to listen to if you ever get the chance. It's marvelous. Uh, a recording of his vocal music, uh, including uh, his chamber opera, The Birth of Something, libretto by Will Eno, has been released by Albany Records. Uh, Professor Brandt is co-founder and artistic director of the Houston-based contemporary music Ensemble Musica, which is an amazing Houston resource. Uh, please go if you ever get a chance. It's a fabulous uh, thing that's here in the city. Uh, Dr. Brandt and neuroscientist David Eagleman recently co-authored a book called The Runway Species, How Human Creativity Remakes the World, which brings us to today's topic. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a fellow member of Ciencia, Tony Brandt. I want to start by offering a big thank you to Rick Wilson, Michelle Devenbrock, CNCO for inviting me here today. And I'm honored to be with you here today to share some of the work that I've done with neuroscientist David Eagleman. In the first part of my talk, I'd like to show that creativity is part of every human brain and that no matter what we're creating, it involves certain basic tools and strategies. And then in the second half, I'd like to demonstrate how art forms such as music give us some of our most direct views of creative thinking and action. For the musical examples, we'll be fo focusing on the string quartets of Beethoven, and we'll close by listening to an entire movement, and I'm super grateful to uh, Sam, Jacqueline, Sergei, and Catherine for being with us here today. So for countless generations, beavers have built their dams the same way and birds their nests, and spiders their webs. But humans aren't like that. Here's the way we built shelters for ourselves 10,000 years ago, and 1,000 years ago, and 100 years ago, and today. And not only do these skyscrapers not look like the buildings of 1,000 years ago, they don't look like each other. So what makes human brains special? Well, first of all, there's the sheer number of neurons. A bee brain has one million neurons. A hamster brain has 72 million neurons. Rhesus macaw monkey has a little over six billion neurons. But we've got over 86 billion neurons in our brains, so that's a lot of firepower. But there's another important difference. Animal brains come largely pre-programmed. Most of their neural pathways are fixed, like links in a chain. Those hardwired neurons are what give animals their repertoire of instincts and reflexive behaviors. 
In contrast, human brains are constantly reorganizing themselves. We have some hardwired instincts, but we're also capable of much more flexible behavior. One of the most important discoveries of recent neuroscience is that our brains remain plastic throughout our lifetimes in a perpetual state of neural remodeling. Now, two of the most important functions of the brain are predicting the future and decision making. It's why we have memories, to make better predictions and decisions. So for instance, there's a sea squirt that spends its early adult life searching around for a nesting place. And then, when it finds one, it attaches itself there permanently and eats its own brain. It is the ultimate couch potato. <laughs> its life having become perfectly predictable, it doesn't need to think anymore. Now, in animal brains, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that enables us to simulate possible futures. Notice how much larger ours is compared to other mammals, and how much greater the percentage of total brain mass that it takes up. And that's true of every human brain. As a result, we have an enhanced ability to speculate about possible futures. In fact, one of the important roles of language is not just referential meaning, it's the ability it gives us to share these hypothetical scenarios. So we can say things that seem to us so ordinary as, well, you know, if you just wait a month, you'll pay less for that car. Or, you'll have a great time if you come to the party tonight. That way of thinking is second nature to us. We do it all the time. And there's more to it than that. As far as we can tell, other animals mainly have the ability to envision things that have already occurred. They learn from experience, but they remain anchored to it. Humans appear to have an enhanced ability to envision things which have never occurred and may never occur. <laughs> no other animal seems to be able to unmoor itself from reality like we can. So imagination can be thought of as predicting something that has never happened before and creativity as making it come true. The more unlikely the prediction, the more original the creative thinking. Shakespeare's Macbeth offers a metaphoric illustration. An apparition tells Macbeth that he will never be vanquished until a nearby forest named Burnham Wood comes to his castle Dunsinane, clearly something very unlikely. But then his enemy Malcolm instructs his soldiers to cut down the trees in Burnham Wood and shield themselves with them as they march on the castle, an ingenious way to conceal their numbers. And so something that has never happened before comes to pass. That's creativity. In ways both small and large, humans are constantly envisioning futures that don't exist yet and then bringing them to life. So why is that? Well, our large and flexible brains are part of the story. But along with that, we're one of the few social species on the planet. We're not the fastest, or the strongest, or the fiercest creatures. But as the world's first hunter-gatherers, our ability for teamwork has been vital for our survival. And in order to engage each other socially, we have to overcome a phenomenon called repetition suppression. Human brains consume about 20% of the body's energy. And a million years ago, long before refrigerators and 24-hour mini-marts, wasting energy was risky. So our brains evolved to be ruthlessly efficient. If the brain recognizes that a stimulus is repetitive or predictable, it pays less and less attention to it. That's what you're seeing in these brain scans, which show less and less of a response to the same stimulus. Look at the difference between the top one third time the brain sees the stimulus and a lot of the brain is lighting up, the 24th time the brain has barely even noticed. So we tune out to the familiar. And that's a problem if we want to bond with each other and maintain long-term relationships. We can't keep zoning out. But surprise engages us. Our brain gets excited when it experiences something new or unexpected. So we have a biological mandate to surprise and impress each other. Our ability to imagine possible futures and our social natures are in a virtuous loop with each other, supercharging our creativity. So humans are very creative. Well, where do new ideas come from? And the answer is they evolve from prior experience. All new ideas belong to a family tree. 
Creativity is a process of derivation and extrapolation. We remodel what we know. Two recent medical cases are instructive. Lonnie Sue Johnson was a very successful graphic artist. She designed a lot of covers for The New Yorker. And then in midlife, she was stricken with brain encephalitis, which destroyed her long-term memory. And unable to draw upon a storehouse of experiences, she was unable to draw. Her imagination was literally hollowed out. And then there's the story of Susie McKinnon, who was born with the rare condition that her brain is not able to create biographical memories. So she lives in a 15-minute slice of the present. She can't remember her childhood or going on vacation. Her husband says they have a very happy marriage because she never remembers that they argued. And if you ask her to imagine possible futures, she can't. It illustrates how much we depend on what we know in order to imagine. Now on the one hand, there's comfort and efficiency in routine. On the other hand, we crave surprise. As a result, as we remodel our experiences, our brains are in a constant tug of war between novelty and familiarity. Too familiar, and we're bored. Too novel, and we're confused. Creativity lives in that tension. And that's why our world is so densely populated with skewmorphs, the digital icons representing objects in the physical world. So on your computer, the save icon is a floppy disk, even though that hasn't been part of computer hardware for over a decade. A phone icon is an old phone handset, even though most of our kids have never seen one of those. Uh, we mail an email in an envelope letter, and we throw out files we don't want, which after all are just zeros and ones, into trash cans. So all of this is a way of keeping an umbilical cord to the past. So new ideas emerge from prior experience. Is there a way to describe how this happens, how new ideas evolve in the brain? David and I argue that when it remodels experience, the brain relies on three basic subroutines working together. In bending, an original is twisted out of shape or transformed in some way. So fonts are an example of bending. Why do we need thousands of ways to write the same alphabet? Because of our compulsion to bend. In breaking, a whole is taken apart and something new made out of some or all of the pieces. Julian Schnabel's plate paintings, like this portrait of actor Dennis Hopper, are examples of breaking. And in blending, a concept introduced by cognitive scientists Mark Turner and Gilles Faconier, two or more sources are merged. If you blend a brilliant scientist with an insect, you get the superhero, the wasp. So bending, breaking, and blending are all around us. For instance, in the lab, reprogramming T cells to fight leukemia is a form of bending, taking something that already exists and altering it. Editing out dangerous mutations of heritable genes using the CRISPR method is a form of breaking. And Ruppy the puppy, who glows in the dark thanks to the merger of canine DNA and the fluorescent gene of a sea anemone, is a form of blending. Now examples like these and many others, the creativity that produced it is often hidden from us and even inaccessible. So for instance, here's a description of the iPhone from a recent book review, quote, its gleaming surface offers no clues about where and when it was made or by whom or how. You can't even open it without a special proprietary screwdriver called a pentalobe. The iPhone knows everything about us, but we know very little about it. Now, one of the most important functions of the arts is that they take the creativity that is often hidden all around us and put it on display. They expose the innards of the creative process. Take Beethoven. To create his main themes, Beethoven bends, breaks, and blends the music he knows and loves. Beethoven didn't invent any scales, and he didn't come up with any new notes. Rather, he used the same scales and chords as everyone else in his time and place, refashioning those musical, musical materials into memorable new ideas. That's already very creative, but Beethoven doesn't stop there. In the course of his piece, he will take it one step further, 
right in front of us, he will bend, break, and blend the themes he's made. And that's when his creativity is most exposed, where we can all hear it. So at the end of this talk, we're going to perform the entire first movement of Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 59, number one. Let's listen now to the main theme. Beethoven gives the melody to the violin, thickens the texture, and adds accents. We recognize it's the same tune, but presented in a way we haven't heard before. That's bending. Breaking, here's the main theme again. Now, Beethoven's going to break that theme in several different ways using different pieces of it. So, for instance, we're going to hear a passage that's based on just the first four notes of the theme. Catherine will play just those first four notes. And now here's the passage based on those four notes. Now here's a passage that uses a different fragment, this time from the middle of the theme. And again, Catherine will play that for us. And now we'll listen to the passage. continually remodel his themes, offering us a workshop in the basic tools of creativity. So to recap, the human mind is like a kitchen. Our storehouse of experiences provide the ingredients, which we then bend, break, and blend to create new mental recipes, such as these edible balloons made with green apple puree and helium, the world's first floating food. <laughs> now, it's not always easy to innovate. That's because brains, in an effort to be efficient, tend to follow paths of least resistance. Certain neural pathways become reinforced over time and become the ready answer, the first thought that jumps to mind. But it's hard to create a surprise by following those paths of least resistance. So innovation requires stepping off those well-worn paths and exploring the brain's vast forest of connectivity. That's why going beyond the first answer and proliferating options is such an important part of the creative process. Now, a lot of times, that'll happen behind the scenes. So, for instance, here are some sketches by industrial designer Max Kulik for a concept vehicle called the City Smoother. 
And here are six of over 70 models that were done by the Architectural Research Office for the Flea Theater they were designing in Lower Manhattan. And none of these sketches actually ended up getting built. Well, in art forms like jazz improvisation, visual art series, and a classical theme and variations, the proliferation is put on display. The goal isn't to find one solution, but as many good solutions as possible. So in this next excerpt, we're going to hear Beethoven take a Russian folk melody and proliferate options right in front of us, finding constantly new ways to present the theme. Towards the end, you'll even hear Beethoven blend the theme with itself. software that made sure the best-selling titles were always in stock. And at its peak, it operated over 9,000 stores worldwide. But it failed to anticipate the move to streaming video, holding on to its right answer for too long. And now all but one store in the U.S. are closed. On the other hand, wander too far from the familiar, and you may fail to find followers. So, Take the QWERTY keyboard layout, which was originally designed, of course, to prevent jam keys on manual typewriters. Well, that's no longer an issue in the digital world, so engineers have proposed other layouts, such as the KALQ keyboard, which is optimized for thumb typing. But the QWERTY keyboard has proven to be stubbornly resilient. So far, none of the other alternatives have caught on. So staying too close can quickly wear out its welcome but wandering too far can fail to catch on. The solution to this dilemma is to proliferate options at different distances from the familiar. For instance, Victor and Rolf have designed ready-to-wear clothing along with far-out haute couture. And car makers constantly, of course, update their current models, but they're also venturing further out into concept vehicles. Now, we're gonna hear this strategy of going different distances from the familiar on display in Beethoven's Diabelli variations for piano, here adapted for string quartet. The quartet is going to play the opening phrase of the theme, followed by three variations of that phrase. And you're going to hear each variation get further and further away from the original theme.
So pieces like the Diabella variations lay bare Beethoven's strategy of not remaining at a fixed distance from the familiar, but scouting near and far. So we've seen how Beethoven bends, breaks, and blends his themes, proliferates options, and takes them different distances from the familiar. All part and parcel of the thinking that underlies all human creativity, and in ways that we can all hear. Now I'd like to show you how Beethoven also helps demonstrate the virtuous loop between our imaginations and our social natures. So around the world, most music making is participatory. The audience is invited to join in. Western classical music is different, and it's a bit of an outlier in this regard. The audience is asked to sit quietly in the dark and just pay attention. And that makes this music vulnerable to repetition suppression. If the performance becomes too repetitive or predictable, our brains are at the risk of tuning out. So remember that a musical performance is just vibrating air, a series of sound waves that appear and disappear. What we call music as an art form, with its themes, patterns, and recurrences, doesn't really exist in the outside world. It only exists in our heads. It's like a sculpture that engraves itself upon our memory. And if we're distracted or our minds wander, that sculpture will be damaged. No matter how heartfelt or profound the music, it will fall on deaf ears. It's like a dropped cell phone call where you keep talking, but the person is no longer listening. As a result, classical music is a virtual encyclopedia of ways to hold our attention through sound alone. Holding our attention is a big driver of a composer's imagination, as I'd like to show you with Beethoven. So for starters, we're going to listen to a passage of Beethoven that he could have written if he weren't concerned about repetition suppression. <laughs> Keep in mind that even bad Beethoven is still pretty good. <laughs> the music's lively and exciting, but I want you to note that Beethoven is saying the same thing multiple times. And there's the risk that those repeated phrases may become overly familiar and your mind may drift off. So now let's listen to what Beethoven actually wrote. but he doesn't say the same thing the same way twice. Instead, he varies his material by adding syncopated rhythms, embellishments, and at the end, asking the violin to climb higher and higher. In other words, he keeps bending his musical ideas to keep us tuned in. Now, as we've seen, uh, surprise catches our attention, and our brains love that. So let's start by listening to this passage from Opus 131. Now Beethoven's going to bring that music back several more times, and there's nothing stopping him from bringing it back always the same way, like this. But there's 
the risk that as lively and fun as that music is, you might start to take it for granted. So let's hear what Beethoven actually wrote when this passage comes back for the last time. chopped up one of his themes and also sprinkled some other music from elsewhere in the movement. He also bends the sound by asking the players to play closer to the bridge. So Beethoven is walking that tightrope here between novelty and familiarity. All of the surprises are music that we've heard before, but now broken up and mixed together in unexpected ways. That makes his music both surprising and comprehensible. Now, making us wait is another way of holding our attention. The neuroscientist Michael Gazzaniga has written about the importance of delayed gratification in human behavior. Our ability to put off rewards helps us maintain our interest and concentration on complex tasks. Now, in music, delayed gratification occurs when we're expecting an arrival, a resolution, a resting point, but the composer puts it off. Let's listen to this bad Beethoven in which the music lands right away on a clear arrival point. is a way of calling attention to something by having multiple emphases occur simultaneously. It's what makes your birthday feel special. People give you presents. Your Facebook friends send congratulations. You blow out candles and eat cake. A lot of things happen at the same time to show you that the event is significant. 
It's like putting an exclamation point on our experience. Rhetorical reinforcement also gives us confidence in our perceptions. For instance, at a baseball game, when a player on the home team hits a home run, think about what happens. The crowd jumps to its feet, the scoreboard lights up, music starts playing, teammates swarm at home plate. You don't have to be a baseball fan to realize something significant has occurred. The coordinated response makes it emphatically clear. So something similar to the home team hitting a home run can happen in music. Let's start with this main theme. is how much attention does Beethoven want to draw to his return? So first, we're going to listen to a version that will tread water on one chord until the theme comes back. So now Beethoven's going to hold that same chord just about the same amount of time. But let's listen to how he uses the creativity to rhetorically reinforce the theme's return. steady, you heard him speed up the rhythm, thicken the texture, raise the volume, and expand the range. That makes us sit up and pay attention. Home run. So Beethoven's inventiveness is amplified by the need to hold our attention. He'll deploy the strategies we've just heard and many others to keep us involved. And from one work to the next, he'll constantly switch up how he applies these strategies because, of course, if his means for holding our attention become too predictable, that defeats the whole point. So thus, in Beethoven's music, we get to experience very directly the virtuous loop between our internal simulations and our social natures. Now let's listen to the first movement of Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 59, Number 1. He'll spend the first part of the movement introducing a series of themes, which he'll then remodel in front of our ears. There is so much inventiveness going on that the piece has only a handful of identical measures. I hope you'll enjoy it.
Quartets of Beethoven are a particularly vivid look inside our mental kitchen. It's not just what Beethoven is expressing, but how he is doing it. He bends, breaks, and blends his ideas, proliferates them, and goes different distances from the familiar. We get to experience a creative mind at work. Creativity is often defined as something that is novel and useful, but that doesn't quite capture the tension between familiarity and novelty that is part of all creative work. In the movement we just heard, Beethoven invigorates the familiar by constantly modifying it and carefully links his new ideas to what has come before. That's what makes his music seem to flow and helps us to follow it. That tempering of the new with the familiar lies at the heart of all human creativity. We all have a bit of Beethoven in us. In our daily lives, we bend, break, and blend what we say and do to engage each other and keep ourselves alert. Beethoven's music is a distilled version of all of that. That's one of the reasons that we feel we get wisdom or insight from listening to it. It helps us understand ourselves and how we relate to the world. Think about it. Beethoven is just moving air around, yet the fate of those air molecules is so absorbing that we'll listen to his music as if our lives depended on it, because, in a sense, they do. The same ingenuity that he shows with his themes is what we use to constantly refresh our lives. And the features of musical experience that grab our attention, such as surprise, delayed gratification, and rhetorical reinforcement, help us to navigate our experiences and build social bonds. In Beethoven's music, and indeed all art, we get an inside look at the imagination that is the hallmark of our species. Thank you to the quartet and to all of you for coming.
Tony has agreed uh, to take a few questions. If, if anyone has a question to ask or wants to be better informed on how to be creative, perhaps. Yes. Tony, thank you for an incredible talk. Just an incredible, elegant, gracious, uh, beautiful talk. Um, my question, uh, on the one hand, you've talked about creativity that is, uh, uh, that is the hallmark of all human activity. But you've also uh, shown the way art has a way of uh, um, taking the creativity we use all the time and uh, pushing it uh, farther, um, breaking boundaries with it in bigger ways. And my question is the following. Uh, could one say that the practice of art, maybe even the study of art, um, could, but, could be said to enhance creative action in all fields? so that uh, the student um, who studies art uh, goes into mathematics with an advantage. So, Deborah, thank you for that great question. Absolutely. I, and that's one of the shared convictions that David and I had in writing the book, was to say that the arts are, are really a, a great classroom for all of the strategies, techniques, and tools that you use in whatever discipline you're going to apply your creativity to. And they are the most overt, and in some sense, also, especially for children, the most immediate, direct, and not dangerous ways of exploring creativity. I mean, you'll never uh, get hurt by a piece of music, whereas that might happen in a chemistry lab. And so, uh, they, th that is, again, uh, you know, so often in the arts, we're, of course, very drawn to what an artist is expressing. But one of the things that I hope to do in this talk is to redirect you also to see the basic tools of our imagination being foregrounded for us in a way that helps us master and recognize them. So thank you, I completely agree. Thank you. So one thing is if you, um, you know, are around people a lot, you find some people have more confidence in thinking Creatively, and other people have less confidence. And what do you think about that? Sure. And you know, uh, the, first of all, it's it, it's fair and appropriate to say that it isn't that everyone is equal in their creativity, nor that everyone applies their creativity in the same way. Very clearly, and humanity's diversity is one of our greatest strengths. And there are all sorts of variations in terms of our personal characteristics, including our level of creativity and our drive to do it. Uh, that being said. Um, you know, the best way to have confidence in anything is to head straight towards it and do it. And I think one of the things that's quite painful about uh, a lot of uh, modern lower education in the United States is that it's this drive to the right answer as fast as you can possibly get there. Um, and that's, of course, what makes standardized testing work. You, there's no reward for taking your time, proliferating options, figuring out different ways of doing it. Your goal is to answer as correctly as fast as possible. And if we really want to instill confidence in all of the children of this country and you know, uh, everyone who has this uh, hardware running in their brain, which is everybody, then we have to give them also opportunities in the classroom to explore, to try out things different ways, to sandbox things without the fear of being graded about them, and all the many, many ways that one we can all discuss together to increase that confidence. You know, any musician will tell you confidence is increased through practice. That's how you do it, you know? And there's no way around it, and we don't give our children enough chance to do that. So, thank you, Mike. Well, all what I'd like to do is invite all of you out for a reception in which you can talk with Tony and others. Uh, but before uh, doing so, I'd really like to, to thank uh, Sergey, Jacqueline, uh, Catherine, and Sam and Tony as well. Thank you very much for hearing.